I want to uh, start out by thanking Mr. Matt Rose, who's here to speak to us today, um, and also Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway for sponsoring this event. Um, we're very thankful that you have uh, underwritten our lunch for us today and are here to share your time with us. I also want to thank um, the Latino Young Professionals Organization, which helps out on all of these luncheons and co-sponsors with Steer Fort Worth. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Maury Padilla here in just a minute for him to um, say a few words. But before I, um, before I go there, I just want to encourage everybody who's here to um, keep in mind the um, uh, the few events that we're going to be have coming up for Steer Fort Worth. We have um, a, our next luncheon is actually going to be on March 21st, and it's going to be at BRIT at 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, I don't have here what the program is going to be, um, so I'll check with Keeman and we'll, we'll give you that update. Uh, there's also some flyers on your table um, about, I believe this is the Fit Worth event that's coming up on March 7th. So if you're interested in that, uh, we have some more for you to take and uh, be sure to put that on your calendar. Um, we're very excited uh, to have um, Matt speak with us today and share transit-related information and what BNSF is doing in the community. Um, if you have, uh, if you want to know more about public transit in Fort Worth, then I would encourage you to to stay tuned to our public transit, Steer Fort Worth Public Transit Facebook page, um, and be on the lookout for a competition and pledge campaign that's going to be we're going to be starting uh, here in the next few months. Um, we also have an exciting mixer coming up for you in May, um, coordinating with with Bike Share and a few of the other organizations in Fort Worth. So more information will be coming out about that. Um, and we're also looking forward to launching a Transaver program in May. So if you are interested in public transit or need that extra push, be on the lookout for that because we hope that will encourage many more people to participate in using the, the transit opportunities that are currently exist in Fort Worth. So I'm going to ask Maury to come up now and, and share a few things about Latino Young Professionals. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, my name is Maury Padilla, the Latino Young Professional Organization. I'm really, really, man, these, these just get better and better every time I, I come to these luncheons and just see all you young professionals, all of us young professionals. Uh, it's so, so, so exciting. Um, really want to talk a little bit about OYP. We're the Latino Young Professional Organization. And one of the things that we're set out to do this year is to definitely create um, partnerships with a lot of the young professional groups that are out there in the city. I know there's a lot of them out there. We definitely want to talk to you. Uh, come talk to us, um, Julian Castillo, Ina Casanova. We've got uh, Susie, Cynthia. We have several representatives here that you can come and speak with us about, and we'd love to sit down with you. We're doing some great, great things. Um, aside from the luncheons, we've, we've got uh, Christmas in July coming up, and you guys will hear all about that. It's a young professionals thing, and we're super excited about that. But uh, with that, uh, just again, so excited. Thank you all so much for being here. It's such an honor for, for us to to really have your attention for, for this one hour and the mayor goes uh, does an awesome job of bringing just awesome speakers uh, for us to listen to. This is really an honor for us to be able to have people like Matt Rose, the leaders in our community, to be able to uh, have access to them in this lunch. And so with that, I'll bring up the mayor. She'll make the proper introduction, Mr. Rose. So uh, thank you so much. Please feel free to go on eating. This is a working lunch, although it's not brown bag, Matt, as we advertise it. It's a little better than brown bag, but please feel free to eat. It's great to see you guys. I missed our last uh, big brainstorm, and I really missed being with you. I think you had a video, but uh, often talk about Steer Fort Worth and the energy and the creative juices that flow with this group and what a great group you are and how much you're doing. I'm excited about the new groups that have come in. It's just really exciting to have all three of our new groups, the Arts and Culture, Health and Wellness, and the Homelessness Initiative. In addition to the four we already have, you know, we've been, you've been working and we've been coordinating our Steer Fort Worth group for about 15 months now. Keeman and Jason Lamerson and I met yesterday and talked about y'all and where we're going. It's kind of like this is a launching pad for the young folks, but it's also a landing pad. If you run into issues as your group moves along, you can come back and talk to us. But the hope is you will be the next generation of Fort Worth leaders. Matt, your successor may be among this group. 
one of these days. We just never know. But it's just great to be with you, and it's always fun to hear great things about you. So keep working. Keep bringing new people into it. I'm very proud of you and the energy that you've brought to this. We want to thank the Hispanic Chamber and the LYPs, Mario, for what you do to help coordinate this. Certainly, we're going to thank Burlington Northern for sponsoring lunch today. That was a very sweet of y'all to underwrite it. Ed McFalls is here with Matt. Ed did the coordination and the underwriting. I'm sure Matt gave the final, but I think Ed did the actual legwork on this for us. Ed is out of control, he says. I know, I never know. I get that too. I never know for sure. <laughs> But thank you for being with us. Keeman and, and the rest of my staff, Misty is here, Brian, Jason, all of my staff. My staff continues to be a bit overwhelmed. We have great initiatives going on in Fort Worth, and I think they're overwhelmed. They just say, you know, we have the hardest time keeping up with the Energizer Bunny, and I keep looking around to see who they're referring to. <laughs> Only I know exactly who they're referring to. So. <laughs> you know, it, they're just exciting things going on in Fort Worth, and we will all take advantage of that. Uh, it, the passion, the energy, it's just incredible. The luncheons have provided great access. Many of you have been, but some of you, this may be your first luncheon. The speakers that we've had have just been amazing. Where do you get to spend an hour with the leader of a Berkshire Hathaway company? You really wouldn't have that opportunity anywhere else. And we've had other tremendous speakers. Coming up for 2013, you'll hear from Lily Biggins, who's the CEO, the first woman CEO with Texas Health, with Harris Hospital. Uh, Nolan Ryan will be with you, which is going to be exciting to see. I'm sure he's going to tell us the Rangers are going to win the World Series. And that'll be great. George P. Bush will be here. And I believe he will tell you about his future in politics, as well as uplift education and things that are going on with them. So it should be a very exciting spring and summer for us coming up with y'all, and I know you're going to enjoy it. But today you're going to hear from Matt Rose, and Matt's an incredible guy. I would say young guy, Matt, but that would it would qualify you're definitely younger than me. You know, he's the CFO of one of the largest rail systems in North America that continues to expand. But the good news is they're headquartered here in Fort Worth. They're our, one of Warren Buffett's companies, and we had the pleasure this fall of hearing Matt and the other three CEOs from the uh, Berkshire Hathaway companies, and it was an incredible round table, so to speak, or panel that you did in your thrones that they put up there. They put these big chairs and set them up there. And it was interesting hearing him talk about Warren Buffett and what they expect of him. Burlington Northern spans 32,000 miles of tracks across 26 states, or 28 states, I believe is right. That's an incredible statistic. Matt serves on many boards, including the American Airlines, the AMR board. Maybe he'll have some information for us today on the merger, as well as a trustee at our... <laughs> no more than we already know, right? He's also a trustee at our hometown school, Go Frogs, and he's a pillar of the Fort Worth community. We're very pleased to have Matt with us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us and to talk to, talk to our young folks. So welcome Matt Rose from Burlington Northern. Okay, do I need to uh, do the microphone? Is this being taped? Or is that camera just for fun? Okay, so I guess I can't rove around too much. Uh, I have no PowerPoint slides. My communications department wrote a, a great speech, which I'm not going to give you. Uh, so what I thought I would do is just uh, talk about three things. Uh, one is um, how the economy is doing from the eyes of the railroad, because we're a pretty good kaleidoscope of the U.S. economy. Uh, two, uh, our leadership model at BNSF, and maybe you can relate to what, we, what we're challenged with and what we're trying to do at our company and see if it gives you any ideas from within your own organization. Uh, and then three, what it's like to uh, run a company within a community, even though um, we're way outside this community as well. We, we operate in uh, all these states west of the Mississippi. And if I forget that order, you all are going to have to help me, okay? Because I'm, I'm getting old. Uh, but first, I want to thank Mayor Price for uh, what she's doing. This is, um, I was telling Amy earlier, we have a, a great leadership in Fort Worth. We get together what I call the Fort Worth Mafia 
about um, once a month. But it's amazing. My wife and I have been talking about this conundrum that I think the city is facing. The, everybody is really getting older, much older. And the people that have done so much for this community, just they um, they're just are aging out like I am. But they're much older than I am even. And I don't see the, the next uh, group of people coming up. And it really is distressing to me. Because I wonder when these great city leaders who we've had running this, literally running this city for so many years, when they uh, pass on, who's going to take this thing? And I think this is a great um, opportunity for your generation, uh, speaking uh, kindly, to step up. Because it really does, the, the, the secret to Fort Worth, Texas, <clears throat> and I deal a lot in Fort Worth, I deal a lot in Dallas. There's a huge difference in the way this city's run versus the way Dallas is run. And it's the leadership collectively that we can get things done. We can get, we can get in a room with 30 people in Fort Worth, Texas and make a decision. You can't even get in a, find a room with 30 people in Dallas. I mean, they have all these different factions and all this stuff. So, so anyways, let's, let, let me end that with a challenge to you. Continue to stay involved in the community because it's where you live. And, and you know, you can sit around and complain, but unless you're involved, it's, it's not really right. Let me tell you a little bit about the U.S. economy. We monitor 22 sub-businesses on the railroad. Uh, everything from uh, minerals to clays to building products to coal, ag, intermodal, international, automotive. Um, and we look at the, the, the U.S. economy in terms of going back to 2006, which was the all-time peak of the economy. And things were really rocking and rolling. Housing was unbelievable. And, you know, just we were just in a great sweet spot. Then we had the big fall starting in the last part, the last quarter of 2006. And then we hit the trough in 2009. And if you look at the difference between 2006 and 2009, we actually fell by about 22% of all of our units. So we lost 22% of roughly 10.6 million units just went away. And certainly it was a, a lot of um, chaos for, I'd been through a lot of things um, in my career, 9-11 and, you know, the Enron failures and stuff like that. But I hadn't been through uh, this deep of a, of a failure. So it was, it was really quite disconcerting. We were all wondering if the U.S. economy was going to come back. We were wondering at BNSF whether we'd be able to borrow money. I mean, we were a deep pockets company, but we didn't know if we were going to have access to the commercial paper markets. 2010 comes along and we, you know, we were all having these conversations. Is it going to be a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery or a, you know, a L-shaped recovery? And do we see green shoots? You all remember all that nonsense talk? Um, and we, we came into 2010 and the economy popped back. The railroad popped back about 10%. And we thought, well, this is going to be a, a V-shaped or a U-shaped recovery. We're on our way back. And then 2011 came and it was 4% growth. And 2012 was about 3% growth. And so we're kind of in this 2 to 3% economy. And we won't get back to our 2006 peak until uh, 2014, maybe 2015. So I would just argue that... Um, when the history books finally close up on this uh, recession, which I always say is the greatest recession since the Great Depression, uh, it will be a seven or an eight year recovery. And I would argue, hopefully, that you all will never face this again in your lifetime. This thing was really ugly. But it does appear now that um, everything is, again, again, continuing to come back. Out of those 22 businesses, we see about 13, 14, 15 of them are positive, and seven, eight are negative. Um, but the good news, I think, in everything is that housing has finally found its footing. And we see it in terms of our lumber products. We see it in terms of our building materials and our appliances and all that. And housing has such a, 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 a spillover effect for the whole U.S. economy. I think we all underestimated it when we went into the recession, and, and we'll probably underestimate the impact coming out of the recession. And, and as we get people back building houses and, and uh, getting in people back in the employment, that's just going to have a huge, huge uh, lift for us. It's really important. This country, uh, quite frankly, is not made for 8% unemployment. We don't have the social framework, the social fabric, to begin to comprehend what 8% unemployment is. And uh, we've got to get this thing going again. And, and I do feel like we're finally we're finally over the hill, and we're finally uh, now in the right trajectory. Uh, but uh, you see what's going on. You know, we're, we're two days away now from uh, sequestration. You see what's going on with the with the folks up in Washington, 
And it's, it's just a shame because that will, that lack of, of decisiveness, that lack of leadership is going to have a, a, an impact of probably about a half of 1% of GDP, which is kind of the last thing we need right now. Um, the things that are really moving on the railroad, housing again, I said, automos, automobiles are moving. We're going to have a good auto, auto year this year. Uh, the things that are not moving is uh, our coal business is down by about 20%. But the one thing that's really unusual to the railroad is uh, we're hauling oil now by uh, rail cars, and um, primarily out of the Bakken Shell, but we're going to see a lot of other, other shell locations around. And uh, our railroad today is hauling about 500,000 barrels a day of oil, which is just amazing. By the end of the year, we'll be up to about 700,000 barrels a day, and then we kind of see a million barrels a day in our, in our uh, eyesights going forward. Just to give you an idea of what a million barrels a day feels like, um, it's t it'll be 22 train loads of oil hauling 100 cars of oil behind each of those cars. 100 cars of oil, 22 of those trains. To give you another illustration of what that, what that might feel like, uh, if you start in Harlingen, Texas, and go all the way up the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to you know, Galveston, Mobile, New Orleans, all that, all the way down to Tampa, St. Pete, we do about a million five barrels a day out of the entire Gulf. And we all think that the Gulf is kind of, you know, uh, the big oil play. We're going to be hauling a million loads, a million barrels a day just on our railroad alone. So big game changer. Uh, you know, it started certainly in the, uh, in the Burnett Shell play here. Um, the Burnett is, um, you know, was all about gas. And what they're finding in these other Shell plays is, is the gas is really the byproduct. And it's the tight oil that is just truly going to change our country for the better for your generation. It's got unbelievable opportunities. Um, so let's talk a little bit about our leadership model at BNSF. We, we've been, uh, this is what I call a, a journey. I became CEO 13 years ago when I was uh, at the tender age of 39 years old. And uh, my uh, predecessor uh, told me he wanted somebody really young and that uh, didn't uh, have a lot of bad habits. <laughs> and I was the only one available, so I got the job. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Um, and at that time, I looked at, quite frankly, wh what, our, what our company looked like uh, demographically. And we were, a, we were an, a, an older company. Our average age was 53 years of age. And what, what had happened was we had gone through so much transition, so much mergers, that we hadn't hired people for a long time. And I thought, boy, when all these 53-year-olds get to 60, because they retire about 60, we're not going to be able to run this company. And so we said, well, we've got to start you know, really recruiting and really replacing the next generation. And then you know, we kind of looked up and said, you know, who would really want to come work for this company? It's an author authoritarian, command and control uh, you know, type of structure. Um, and it didn't feel like a great place for um, for the people at that time coming out of school that they'd want to come to work. So we, we decided we, have to go, we had to go through a, a transformation, and we did. And we developed what we call a lead, our leadership model. Each of your companies has one. Each of your organizations you work for, if you work for a nonprofit of the city or whoever, you all have a leadership model. You may not know it. You may not see it, but there is one. And so uh, we, we really started with uh, trying to focus on the the two sides of performance, uh, the, the how, which is achieving some goal, uh, and then most importantly, the what. Uh, but the what is how you achieve the goal, and the how is how'd you, how'd you do on that goal. And we started literally measuring people's performance on that and rewarding people, and we recruited to that model. Uh, we developed some tentacles of what we call the leadership model in terms of modeling the way. You know, people don't, uh, they won't really care what you say, they'll watch what you do and how you behave. Uh, communication, a big part of our leadership model, uh, creating a compelling vision of why people ought to follow in that path. And uh, we've been at it now. This is our 13th year, and I tell people we're still very much in our journey. It takes a long time to change the culture of our company, but that's, that's kind of what we've been working on. Let me spend a few minutes on uh, the role of BNSF in the community. You know, when I got here on the scene, uh, the big power companies in town were uh, Radio Shack, Pier One, uh, Lockheed, uh, Bell, BNSF was just coming, kind of coming into its own. And we've seen a lot of transformation uh, within those companies. We've seen some of the gas guys come in. Some of them are not really native. Some of them are owned subsidiaries. But, but our, our corporate structure here has changed quite a bit. And um, we've been uh, real uh, steady through that uh, in terms of our role in the community. We, uh, 
We play, we try and play hard in uh, what we do. I require each of my executives on my leadership team, which is our top 38 people, to be a part of a nonprofit, to be involved. Uh, our foundation then comes along and supports them. Uh, we do a lot of different things uh, from a philanthropy project. We do a thing called Stay in Track, where we put people into some of the schools locally here just to, quite frankly, read with them, be with them, mentor them. They come up to the campus. We try and illustrate, you know, if you'll stay in school, stay on track, you can come work as this type of job, that type of job. And, you know, it's not a, it's, there's not a lot of publicity on this program. We don't want a lot of publicity. We've just got our people who have said, I'm willing to donate some time to go hang with a bunch of kids from uh, underprivileged areas that need help. Our foundation uh, is pretty active. We, uh, we are, uh, our foundation, when I took it over, was all about the arts. We were really big contributors to the arts of Fort Worth. We've, we've less, lessened that a little bit and re re repositioned our foundation to help uh, in some areas of, uh, of, of need. Uh, we're really big United Way supporters. We, we will uh, always be in the top one or top two companies in, the, in Tarrant County. We support all the uh, universities, the schools here, UTA, TCU, primarily out of selfish greed. We, we want to hire people. We want to, you know, we want to be able to find the next workforce. And uh, so that's, that's what we do. We, uh, we're very active on both those campuses and, and quite frankly our CMT programs, our college management programs are, are pretty much reflective of that as well. There's been a lot of debate, a lot of discussion about uh, passenger rail in our community, transit, high-speed rail, all those things. We, uh, we're pretty much a, uh, a company that believes that communities should make that determination whether or not they want passenger rail and at what cost. We try and help facilitate that. It's, uh, these things are always very, very hard. Uh, but you know, we believe longer term as our country grows uh, from 308 million people to 350 million people, and the Metroplex grows to 20 million people, uh, we're gonna need uh, mass transit. We're gonna need all sorts of commuter rail, bike pass, uh, bus, all those things. Uh, there's companies that, quite frankly, look at our lack of transportation in the Metroplex, our lack of mass transit, and they won't live here because of that. I was on the Boeing search committee about um, 11 years ago. It was one of the few uh, bipartisan uh, efforts by Dallas and Fort Worth. And, uh, you know, they came down and we, we showed them all around. And, and, you know, one of the things they kept coming back to is, where's your mass transit system? We're like, well, you know, we, we, got, a, we got a bus, you know, we got pickup trucks. Uh, so it didn't really work. And they, they, they literally, I mean, they moved to Chicago, I think, well, two reasons. One is, uh, the CEO had a large boat, wanted to put on Lake Michigan, which, which never really came out. Uh, and then two, because of the mass transit issues for their employees. So we uh, will we'll, we'll work with the community uh, of Fort Worth as well as we work with other communities. We operate passenger rail. We operate 300 trains a day of commuter rail around the country. It's quite amazing. We operate about uh, uh, 20, 22,000 people ride BNSF trains and, and commuter rail trains, Seattle, Tacoma, Chicago, LA, uh, Albuquerque, all over the country. Okay, so that's it. Let's talk questions, comments, complaints, and I'll try and avoid your questions when I get them. Who's got the first? Yes, ma'am. Speak up real loud. My name is Sandra Rodriguez. I graduated last year from my um, uh, at TSU and I got uh, in majoring in business administration. I got over 10 years of experience in the railroad business and I've been applying to BNSF for about 15 years. <laughs> and I haven't got the opportunity of an interview. Uh, my question is, um, uh, based on diversity, how will you include Hispanic women in the uh, business strategy of in the future. Program. Yep. So uh, I sit on the American Airlines board, I sit on the AT&T board, and I sit on, you know, I'm, I run a big railroad, and, and there's a big difference between uh, those three. There's a lot of similarity because they're both network businesses, but they, they basically fall into two different buckets, consumerism and industrial, right? So for consumerism, you know, American Airlines literally has a, um, a program to attract New York, New Yorkers, you know how they are, 
New Yorkers to fly out of LaGuardia, right? I mean, that's, they have a whole advertising that makes fun of New Yorkers because that's what New Yorkers like. AT&T has a whole, whole effort to attract uh, African-American men to smartphones. They have a whole effort to attract Asian women. I mean, these are very deliberate, very calculated programs to reach out to uh, what is what we call minorities in this country, which is soon going to be a misnomer because they will be majorities. Okay, so BNSF, you know, if I ran advertising to uh, individuals for, uh, let's just say, Hispanic females, um, you know, we really want to ship your uh, loads of lumber, Hispanic females, you know. <laughs> You get my point? So it doesn't really work. So why is, why is diversity important for us? Well, the reason why diversity is important for us, when we look at our workforce, it's a tremendously diverse workforce. What, when I first started, though, as CEO 13 years ago, what was not diverse at all was our leadership team. It was white male. And uh, so we have had a very significant effort, quite frankly, to uh, recruit at the CMT level, college management training <laughs> level, the intern level, hire frontline supervisors when we go out and recruit military people. We're just force feeding to get more and more diverse people up. And quite frankly, we have a goal of about 50% of our new hires to make sure that they're diverse employees. Because at the end of the day, what we want our leadership team to do is to reflect the communities in which we operate. Well, think about where we operate. We operate in Arizona. Well, what's that like? Well, that's Hispanic and, and Native American. Uh, New Mexico, same thing. Chicago, Illinois, you know, South Side of Chicago, African American, um, North Dakotans, you know, the frozen heads. I mean, you know, we have to have people know how to ice fresh fish. So we we want we want our leadership team to reflect that. We're this is very much a work in progress. So we 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 take it very seriously, and and we do that through mentoring, mentoring circles, you know, young professionals group. We we try and seed that more and more. Uh, help, and you know what you ought to do is just get me your card, and and we can figure out why you haven't been interviewed. But because we're we're actively trying to recruit uh, people, we have a big presence in Mexico. We have a large Mexico business unit, stuff like that. Who's got the next? Yes. During President Obama's first term, you were one of his advisors. What are some of the jobs council? Yeah, I just got laid off oh. <laughs> two weeks ago. Waiting for my severance check. It hasn't come. Can you help me out? So, I guess now it's not applicable anymore since you got laid off. I got off. laid off. Okay. But what were some of the pressing issues that you guys were discussing, your hot topics? Yeah. So, we had about six topics, uh, and some of them were what I call, you know, trying to boil the ocean, education, uh, entrepreneurship, um, you know, uh, transportation infrastructure. What I, what I dealt with was, quite frankly, regulatory issues and, and the reason is because we do a lot in terms of regula regulations and uh, how to cut through, um, you know, the bureaucracy of doing anything in this country now, building anything. Uh, we had uh, lots of engagement with the president. You remember under one of the uh, stimulus plans, there was this thing coined shovel-ready projects. And the, the president, you know, to his chagrin, found out that there really were no shovel-ready projects because the permitting process NEPA, CEQA, and all these things uh, literally grind this stuff to a halt. Uh, so let me give you an, exa an example on the railroad. We've been out in uh, Southern California uh, in Los Angeles working uh, for eight years trying to get the, a, a permit to build an intermodal facility kind of like we did at Alliance. And we've spent over $40 million. And uh, it just got released last Friday. Now, we will go through litigation for years on top of that. So it will be an 11, 12 year period before, since we were, we stepped forward and said we want to spend $500 million to build an intermodal facility, to take trucks off the highway, to free up the highway for commuters to be able to run, to improve the environment, to reduce our dependency on foreign oil. And the process that we all live in said, okay, uh, it'll take you about 12 years and about $60 million before you can put a shovel in the ground. We've, we've lost perspective in this country um, in terms of that. Our, my parents, your grandparents built the U.S. highway system back in the 50s, in the 60s under President Eisenhower. And they did it because there was a national need and the whole country got behind it and there was a lot of sacrifice. 
we as a community today don't have a hard time getting behind those types of things. Um, not in my backyard, extreme environmentalism, uh, you know, everybody's got a, a different deal. I mean, you saw when our, our governor um, announced the, uh, the Trans Corridor Project to, you know, this concept to take all this infrastructure, highways, water line, uh, highways, electrical lines, railroads, and put them in a big, big infrastructure project. Um, I mean, he got plastered for that. And there was lots of problems with that concept, but the least we should have done was had a great debate in the state of Texas about the pros and cons with it. And what happened was that the NIMBYs, uh, you know, not in my backyard, uh, there's one other one uh, now, it's, I, can't, I can't say because I'm being filmed, but uh, <laughs> it's even worse. So I worked on regulatory issues, that's kind of where my passion was. And, even got into this, you know, project permitting reform. We had a great dialogues with the president. Um, they, you know, they, they, uh, they took a lot of our recommendations. They didn't take a lot of our recommendations, but you know, I felt like that we laid lots of stuff out there for them. And you know, sometimes you, it's kind of like the Simpson Bowles Commission. You know, when Simpson Bowles came out, everybody kind of said, "No, we don't, we don't want that at all." Well, now, as we move towards sequestration and we move towards budget. Uh, uh, redoing the budget and the tax code and everything, you keep hearing this word, Simpson, Bowles, Simpson. Well, if you're a Democrat, you say Bowles, Simpson, Bowles, Simpson. If you're a Republican, you say Simpson, Bowles, Simpson, Bowles. But you're seeing the seeds of all that. They're, they've got all that stuff that was, you know, it was, it was like 22 people worked for three years, and they're going back and picking up all that work that was done. So I think that that's, that's our hope with the Jobs Council stuff, that over time, more and more stuff will be picked up. Yes? Um, it seems like new shoring uh, seems to be the new trend in the future. What is? New shoring. New shoring, yeah. yeah. So, you know, given the right. cost and currency and whatnot, do you, how much of an impact do you see that will have on the U.S. economy and also the NSF infrastructure? Yep. So the, the old U.S. economy looks something like this. You know, we would take a raw material to a plant site, build it in the United States, and then we would transport it to a DC distribution facility, then they'd move it to a store and then you go in and buy it at the, you know, TGNY. And you guys don't even remember TGNY. <laughs> Eddie does. <laughs> Walmart, I mean. <laughs> then we then then what happened was we decided to offshore. We we started taking raw materials to the coast take them from on a boat, take them to the coast. We'd produce stuff in China. We started in, in actually in Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, China. And then we would fly it back, FedEx, UPS, or we put it on a steamship line, bring it to the West Coast, bring it into the U.S. railroad network and distribute it like that. Now we're hearing, well, what's going on? Well, we're seeing wage inflation in China, which is quite frankly a good thing because that will raise their standard of living. That will change their deck. Um, but it means that manufacturing costs are going up. So Mexico is really in a great position to have this near, sh what we call the nearshoring into Mexico. But it changes, quite frankly, the supply chain. So places where you were investing, ports, railroads, highways, intermodal connectors, all these things, we'll have to realign some of that stuff to make sure that we can handle that. Will it eventually come back to the United States? Uh, hydraulic fracturing has the potential to change our country's uh, future. For manufacturing specifically, it, it has the ability to, to, to really have a great impact. Whether or not the workforce of today, the young people of today will want to go work in a manufacturing environment or not, is, I don't know. And then a little bit is going to depend on what, quite frankly, China and India and Vietnam are going to do because they have this, there's just this enormous population grow, uh, uh, population over there of you know, 1.3 billion in, in China, 1 billion in, in India, a uh, couple hundred million in Vietnam. And so there's, there's just so many people over there that need, need to work. And uh, the government may, may, as, may assist in their ability to remain competitiveness in the, in the global supply chain. But we'll see. But it'll have a big impact. Yes, Amy. You brought up a couple of them, really great points about public transit. <coughs> what, what would you say is the number one thing Fort Worth should do to further our the transit situation. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I say first off, 
and as a nation, we always get into this debate about do we want high-speed rail? The reason why our country hasn't gone to high-speed rail, commuter rail, and things like that is because we don't price gasoline. We don't price carbon. And, you know, people always say, well, will, will high-speed rail work in the country? And I always say, well, tell me what the price of gas is going to be. If the price of gas is going to be 4 bucks, then the answer is no. If the price of gas is going to be 8 bucks, then the answer is yes. So we as a, we as a society, we have to figure out, do we, do we want to incentivize more people driving on the highways, or do we want to incentivize people taking more mass transit? Europe made that decision. They priced up gas, and they've gotten people out. They took all that money, and they built really, really high-quality, high-speed rail infrastructure, bike paths, commuter rail, buses, all that stuff. And so when you go to Europe now, you know, you, you say, do, do I want to rent a You know, we're going to Italy this summer. Do I want to rent a car? Are you crazy? You want to get on the, the train system or the bus system, and that's how you get around. Um, you know, you come into DFW. And you go, you know, I'd like to have a high-speed train down to, you know, San Antonio. Like, well, that's interesting, but it's not going to work, <laughs> right? So I, our, soci our big, big society first is going to have to get through this because, you know, nobody's going to like hearing this, but gas is too cheap. We incentivize as a society to incentivize people to go buy pickup trucks and, you know, a lot of times with gun racks, and, and that's how we get around. Fort Worth specifically, it's really hard. You're gonna to have to have a. We're gonna to have to have a, a really understanding, long-term vision. The capital piece will be easier because the feds have money and they want to splash it on us to to build networks. They're trying to get people to do it. What what you have to understand though is going to, what's going to be the ongoing operating expenses, and um, that's all going to be on ridership. And so the better, you know, quite frankly, the the more uh, efficient the route stops are, the where the better the connectivity, like to the airport and things like that. The more people are going to ride it, the more, the better the the transit stops are. The more development around those transit stops. I mean, Chicago's done a wonderful job. We operate what's called the Naperville line. If you go from downtown Chicago out to Naperville, that's all BNSF. I fly it every once in a while. There's not a spot left on our rail line that has not been developed around these uh, passenger stations where people stop, you know, they stop all these locations between downtown and Naperville. Developers have come in and they figured out you put, you know, restaurants and cleaners and little grocery stores and that's, but if we're not going to do that, then people aren't going to want to ride it. And the city's going to end up paying a lot of operating expense and the mayor's going to have a frowny face. <laughs> Because to add on that goes not just the price of gas, but also that we will be in gridlock on our highways. Yep. So it's our job as a city and as a team to move forward on these projects so that people have that choice when the time comes. They didn't realize they needed that. Right. No, I, I, I have been... Uh, I didn't like when people people didn't like me hear 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 me say it. I live up in you know what the Fort Worth Mafia calls Southern Oklahoma. I live in West Lake, Texas. I mean it's <laughs> South Lake, East Lake, West Lake. It's really not Southern Oklahoma, but that's the way these people feel down here. Um, I've 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 been very public saying that we are cutting off North Northern Tarrant County to downtown. We're cutting it off because of our highway congestion, and until we decide that we're, we're going to do something about it. We're doing a great job. I mean, we're doing it now, but it's taken so long. We've missed out. I, I mean, I'll tell you one that I know of. I can't say it because I'm being filmed. One Fortune 100 company we lost, and they went to Irving because of our highway gridlock coming down, and they were going to relocate out to Circle T Ranch, but to access downtown, they would have had to go, you know, the 170, 35 juggernaut, and they just weren't going to do it. Anybody else? Yes. Talking about your foundation, are you primarily active in the Fort Worth community, or do you go to the communities where your rail lines? Yeah, it's it's everywhere. We probably spend a third of the money here in Fort Worth, but then we also look at our United Way, where we we will contribute about our employees will contribute about two million dollars. So we think that that's kind of above and beyond. But uh, you know, we operate in all these quite frankly small towns, and we can put in ten thousand dollars to do something in Alliance. Nebraska, and it's a big, big deal. And we have, you know, we have 3,400 people here in Tarrant County, but we've got 40,000 people total. 
so what we've done on our foundation, uh, when I first became CEO, you know, I was getting all these, you know, requests. Would you, you know, would you help, you know, little juniors baseball team go to, you know, Seguin, Texas, and play? And we need, you know, forty-two dollars. And so, you know, we what we did, we realigned our foundation, and we just told, we, we said, okay, listen, we're going to do what we call matching gifts, and we now do twenty thousand dollars per employee matching gifts. So when somebody calls and says, you know, we need little Johnny's team to go to Seguin, we say, well, fine. Tell you what, you put in 24, we'll put in 24 on the match foundation, and, you know, he can go. And so we have people that match in a big way. So what we tell people is don't, don't come to us and ask for a company gift. If you're involved with, you know, women's shelter or, or anything, you know, don't forget to feed me. My, my daughter worked at that place. You know, don't come to us for a company gift unless you're given and the foundation's giving as well. You're, you know, your money, your heart lies where you're giving your money to. And if you want us to give as a company, you better be giving too. So we've given our employees lots of money to be able to fulfill their destiny. <laughs> yes? Tell us about Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, your name's been mentioned as next successor to, to Buffett. I know you're not going to tell us, but... <laughs> Am I on film? I'm going to make an announcement. <laughs> Oops, I can't. I'm sorry. Are we going to lose you to Omaha? Now, so Warren is a great, great guy to work for. Um, but you really don't work for him because he's, he is, um, he's really, really hands-off. Um, the day that our transaction occurred, and that was three weeks ago last week, three weeks ago last week, that sounds a lot logical, three years ago last week, February 12, 2010, I called him that day and I said, okay, Warren, you know, we just got the shareholder vote, you know, what do I need to do? You need me to come to Omaha, bring some PowerPoints, you know, show you some numbers? <laughs> He's like, I don't need any of that stuff. He says, um, send me what you think I'm going to find interesting. Send me the financials once a month and then tell me how you're doing once a quarter. That's what I do. And I, I talk to him, you know, probably once a month on something that's not even related to the railroad. But at the end of the day, what he does, he, he has just unique uh, ability, and I've never seen it like anybody else in my life. He's got 76 companies. Now, we're the largest, but he has got 76 other companies that he, that he looks at their, you know, balance sheet, income statement, everything else. He knows my balance sheet better than I do. I look at it all the time. He just has a phenomenal grasp, memory, understanding, ability to cut through it. And um, he's just a great, you know, we go through, we do a five-year plan, which he doesn't want to see. He just, you know, he, I only give him a one-year plan. But we were in, uh, October's our kind of our planning time, October, November. And we're, we're sitting around our leadership team. We're, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of a little goosey about the economy. Is it really back? Are we on firm footing now? Can we let the good times roll again? And what's going on here? And, so we put out these five-year assumptions, what's housing going to do, what's autos going to do, what's CPI going to do, what's health care costs going to do. And I mean, there was like 25 of these assumptions. And my, my little head's just kind of swimming in all these numbers. I'm thinking, you know, I just would like for somebody outside this room to be able to look at all this stuff and tell me if I'm, if I'm right or wrong. I'm thinking, who could I send this to? I thought, well, Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan. I could send it to Glenn Hubbard at the White House. And I could send it. Warren. So I sent it to Warren. And he, you know, he called me back the next day and said, I got all your stuff. This is what I think you're right on. This is what I think you're wrong on. But it's just great to have a, you know, what I think who's, who I think is the smartest guy in the world uh, in business to look at this stuff and just to validate what we were doing right and what we were doing wrong. I avoided that second question really well, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem is, yeah, I think the problem is that we have a really hard time explaining to the American public in general what congestive costs can do to a society and the economic impact of congestive costs. 
And in public policy, we've done a really crummy job of creating confidence in our public money that's being spent on infrastructure, i.e. the bridge to nowhere, things like that. People hear that bridge to nowhere and they're like, what? You want me to raise the gas tax? You want to, you want to assess my registration fees to pay for this and that? And, and quite frankly, even Seattle had a little trouble, had a little um, malfeasance with uh, sound transit. But they were able to, you know, rise above it, demonstrate the, the great value of that. And so I think, you know, a, a group being able to really articulate the city's vision and, and what this city's going to do in the next 20 years from a growth standpoint, it's not going to work unless we do something. I mean, it's going to be a parking lot out there. And, and what, again, what people don't understand in this country, we really don't have a transit problem. What we have is a freight problem, okay? It's the freight that's on the highways that's, that's causing the problem for the commuters. So you say, well, let's just get those darn trucks off the highway. Well, okay, bring them to the railroad. But, however, <laughs> if you just eliminate them totally, then, then you, will, you will go to Walmart or Cabela's and there will be nothing on the shelves. The only reason those trucks are out there is because they're providing this, this big consumer area. Now, a lot of these trucks are coming in through the NAFTA corridor, and we're just going to have to, you know, that's why the Trans-Texas corridor was so interesting. But we're going to have to find ways, very creatively, with other people's money, to provide bypasses maybe for truck routes, things like that, because NAFTA is only going to grow, and it's only going to clog up these highways more and more. Anybody else? We done? Thanks. Great questions. Appreciate what you guys do for Fort Worth, Texas. gifts for you guys. Um, that's thank you gifts very much. Yeah. Phoenix from LAP can help us. Thank you again to uh, Mr. Falls for oh, wow. you just, sponsoring this. You got a gift? You did. Give me that gift. Here, Matt. Oh, no, you both got one. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you both very much, and uh, we, we really appreciate your time here. Um, I uh, wanted to give uh, Mr. McFalls an opportunity um, as the sponsor for this evening, this afternoon, actually, to if you wanted to say a couple words. Wow. Okay. Nothing like nothing like being put on the spot, right? Uh, well, first of all, I'm here in uh, in the presence of of Roland Breedenberg because he was supposed to be here, but he's somewhere down in Houston. And then Joanne Osowski, who is our CIO, was planning on being here, but she has a plane to catch, and so. I was the third option. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is our pleasure uh, to support this organization. I'm pleased that we have several of my BS BNSF colleagues here. Would you please stand up? And I, I think Matt said it uh, very, very well. Uh, uh, we have a, an organization, a company, uh, that is seasoned, and we are constantly recruiting talent into this organization. And from a diversity standpoint, about 19% of our workforce is made up of people of color. And if you look at our hiring statistics over the last uh, 10 years, we've actually hired 30,000 new employees into our business, 30,000 since 2003. And about 5,100 of those have been African Americans or Hispanics. And so there are opportunities in the railroad. Most people do not think about our industry. They think about the Googles. They think about the, the Yahoos and the Microsofts. But this is a phenomenal industry that we work in. And I can say that from experience because I've worked in telecommunication, I've worked in high-tech manufacturing, and I came here from Coors Brewing Company about 10 years ago. This is one of the finest brand companies, not only in the United States, but, but in the world. And that is why our owner, Warren Buffett, decided to buy us. And I think when he first came out to our management team meeting, he said he had only one regret, and that regret was that he didn't buy us years ago. <laughs> And so uh, we appreciate being here. We appreciate the sponsoring. And we wish you all very, very good luck in, good luck in, in any of the careers that you decide for yourselves.
Um, again, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you to LYP for uh, being, being such great partners with Steer Fort Worth on these. Thank you again to Mr. Rose and uh, to Mr. McFalls for, for making this event happen. Really appreciate it. You guys have a good afternoon.